Hi, I'm Doug Hayhoe, and I've written a series of short video essays and podcasts on science, faith, and other topics. Most of the videos relate to one of God's two books, Nature or Scripture. This video is about one of the greatest musicians that ever lived. It's called Johann Sebastian Bach, His Science and His Faith. I'm sure you've heard of Bach before. I've heard of him all my life. What I didn't realize until recently, however, is how he combined both science and faith in his music. When my siblings and I were young, our grandmother paid for all of us to take piano lessons. The last piece I learned to play was a prelude and fugue by Bach. Bach and Handel were the greatest Baroque music composers. I didn't appreciate Bach's music when I was young, however, nor for most of my life, preferring to listen to the classical symphonies and of Beethoven or the romantic waltzes of Chopin on the piano. Here's a table I'm going to show that shows how these different periods of music were related. So there was Baroque first, Bach, Handel, and Vivaldi. That led into classical, Beethoven, Haydn, Mozart, and others. That led into romantic music, Chopin, Liszt, and Tchaikovsky. And then, of course, we have the 20th century, Bernstein, Gershwin, and Stravinsky. Recently, a friend encouraged several of us to go to Bach's St. John Passion. The way Bach captured the emotions of Christ in this passion of his disciples, of the opposing crowd during the first Easter week, reminded us of Bach's unique contribution to music. He was the master of counterpoint, a style that involves different melodies that interact, creating melody and harmony at the same time. I then read up on Bach's faith and began to appreciate his deep respect and belief in God's word. Here's a brief biography of Bach before I get into his science and his faith. He was born in 1685 and grew up in a German family where everyone was a musician. Ancestors back five generations, children and grandchildren and cousins and nephews. As a toddler, he no doubt crawled behind the organs and harpsichords his family was constantly repairing. Bach learned to perform from a young age. His father taught him violin, an uncle the organ, and a brother the clavichord, which was a precursor to the piano. When Bach was 15, he went to St. Michael's School to study music, as well as Latin, Greek, and theology. When he graduated, he got a job as a teenage church organist. It wasn't long after this that Bach composed all kinds of music, violin solos, orchestral music, choral music, and popular secular tunes. When he was music director in a church in Leipzig, he began each week by composing a new piece, then spent the week training the musicians and singers so they could play it that Sunday. He also prepared for many religious holidays and royal performances. Bach's first wife, a cousin, was also a musician. After she passed away, he married a soprano singer who helped him with his compositions. Altogether, he had 20 children, although only half lived to adulthood. Four of those were musicians. Bach died from a bad infection in 1750 when he was 65 years old. Here's a painting of him shortly before he died. I now have to talk about the science of harmony so you can appreciate a little why Bach was so great. It's going to be easier to explain harmony if I sit at a keyboard where I am now. I'll just show you the keyboard here. The ancient Greek philosopher Pythagoras noticed that the frequencies of notes that sound pleasant together form a simple ratio. So an example is when the C, middle C, and then a C an octave above is played with middle C. Let me do that for you, middle C and an octave above. Notice the harmony there. In the Pythagorean harmonic system, the frequencies are 5, 12, and 256. So let me show that one again. There you can see that. C is 256. There it is. And the C above, an octave above, is 512. Exactly double the frequency. Now, let me play C and G together. Look at those frequencies, 256 and 384. If you reduce those numbers to their simplest ratio, instead of 256 to 384, you would get a ratio of 4 to 6 or 2 to 3. So what do they sound like? Harmonious. That's what Pythagoras noticed back in the days of the Greeks. If I played G flat, listen what would happen. 
doesn't work. Now it works. If you read my written essay in the appendix of it, I can explain the science of why this works in terms of standing waves. Now, look at the chart here, and you get C and E, 256 and 320. Those ratios are 5 to 6, or 4 to 5. So there's C, 256, E, 320, and G, 384, or a ratio of 4 to 5 to 6. So I'm going to play them together. A major chord. Now, if I take the 320 and reduce it to E flat, it doesn't sound quite so good. So that's why it's called a minor chord. It gives kind of a sad note to it because the numbers don't line up so simply. There they go again. And an octave. Okay, so let's just think about that a little bit. It's a big problem, however, with harmonically tuned keyboards, like this one here. Major chords in other keys, except C and G, don't sound as nice. In the key of D, for example, the major chord involves these three notes. D, which you can see is 288 frequency, uh, and F sharp, you don't see it, but it's 363, and then A is 426.7. And you can work it out if you look at the written essay with a calculator in your hand. The frequencies are not multiples of 4, 5, and 6, as in the key of C, but rather multiples of 4, 5.04, and 5.9. So the major chord doesn't sound quite as pleasant. And you get the same problem in almost all the keys except C and G. This problem had been known for centuries, and many attempts were made to adjust frequencies to give a keyboard of equal temperament. But none really caught on until box day. That means you could play anything in any key and it would sound equally good. When Bach started composing, the German organist Workmeister had just devised a well-tempered keyboard. So what he did was he adjusted the frequency of the 12 notes so that the full octave ratio to, was still 2 to 1, as the C above, middle C. This worked in all the keys, as well as the perfect fifth ratio, C to G, in the key of C, is still 6 to 4, or 3 to 2. They were still the same no matter what key you were in. But the compromise was that the major third ratio, which in the harmonic keyboard was 5 to 4, became a little sharper, 5.04 to 4. Both Workmeister and Bach decided that people could live with this compromise, and thus they could enjoy all the keys. So here you see it here, the harmonic keyboard on the left, which we've looked at, and then on the right you have the well-tempered keyboard. Notice that C is no longer 256, its frequency is 261.63. Uh, so they raise a little bit, and you don't see the octave above C, but it'll be exactly double, double 261.63, which would be 523. And you still, you can see C, E, and G, and if you had a calculator, you'd work out the frequencies. They wouldn't be 4, 5, and 6, but they would be 4, 5.04 and 6. E would be a little bit higher. That's the compromise. But this will be true. You can work out the ratios in any scale. For example, a major chord in the key of E, E, G sharp, and B, which will be 329.63, and G sharp way at the top is 415, and um, B is 493. It would again have the ratio 4, 5.04, and 6. Equally tempered. Workmeister was the theorist. Bach was the practitioner who quickly went to work composing both a major and a minor prelude and fugue for each of the 12 keys. He also used the complex counterpoint strategy throughout. One hand plays one tune, the other hand plays another tune, but they respond to each other. We'll see an example of this counterpoint in a few minutes. So this new well-tempered keyboard sounds good in whatever white or black key you want to play in. Since there are seven white keys in an octave and five black keys, that means you have 12 different keys to play in or to compose for. And in fact, if you want to compose both major and minor sounding pieces as Bach did, then you have 24 different keys. And so what did Bach do? So following Workmeister, Bach decided to compose major and minor preludes and fugues at all 24 keys. That was a brilliant move, a really brilliant move in the scientific history of music, you might say. 
What is a prelude and a few? Well, a prelude is a brief introduction to another piece, a larger piece, usually a religious ceremony, as, of course, Bach was involved in. A fugue is a musical composition in which a theme is repeated by successive tunes in counterpoint, as we're going to see. When Bach had finished composing a complete set of these 24 preludes and fugues, this set, this book, became known as the Well-Tempered Keyboard, the Well-Tempered Clavier. Clavier means keyboard. It may be the most important work of music ever composed, the Well-Tempered Clavier by Johann Sebastian Bach. I'm going to play the first minute or so of Bach's Prelude and Fugue number three, played by Paul Barron. And you can notice the counterpoint where the melody goes back and forth between the right and left hand. So wait a minute while I just set this up. Over. Okay, here it is. the hands. Major tune carried by the left hand to the right hand and the other hand responding. It's counterpoint. That's probably enough. Um, enough for me too. So I didn't really warm up to this music um, even though I had to play it. My last point. Um, Baroque music. Bach was really the, the still part of the Baroque era um, and the classical romantic composers that followed him, Mozart, Beethoven, Chopin, and, and Schumann, right? But what did these romantic and, cla and classical composers do? They used Bach's preludes and fugues every day for their practice. This was according to the BBC's Greatest Composer series on YouTube. You can watch that. So Bach is really the father of classical music. Bach always signed his music to the glory of God. And he expressed the goal of music in these words. The final aim and reason of all music is nothing other than the glorification of God and the refreshment of the Spirit. Pretty religious sounding words. Yet some scholars throughout the centuries have argued that Bach was really a modernist, that his religious work was a necessary part of his job in Lutheran Germany, where he lived at that time in the 1700s. An important discovery in 1933, however, 200 years after Bach, revealed Bach's true respect for God's Word, the Bible. His three-volume family Bible, called the Kalaf Bible, with the date of 1732 written in its cover, was found in an American collection, probably carried over by their ancestors from Germany. It had been lost for two centuries. This was the only copy, it still is the only copy of Bach's personal Bible. Now, Bach's Bible contained, uh, com contained the text of the Lutheran translation of the Bible, obviously, along with the commentary taken from Luther's writings. And it was organized by a theologian, a Lutheran theologian called Kalaf, so it's called the Kalaf Bible. So when they found it after 1933, they donated it to the Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, realizing how important it was. Well, for 50 years, it sat there. And then in 1985, after modern technology like lasers had been invented, the seminary had Bach's Bible scientifically examined using this advanced technology. What did they find? Most of the comments and notes in it were identified as likely written by Bach himself. They weren't added later by someone else. Copies of the Bible were then made and sold to university libraries, like the University of Toronto, where I live. So I was able to go down and examine it recently, and I could see Bach's underlining. I could see his emphasis, where he also often wrote NB, Latin for note well, and it Bach's occasional handwritten comments. So English translations of the text in Bach's comments were also included in this copy. So here's a picture of me down at the Cavan Library on St. George a street in the University of Toronto. And on the right is a picture of the cover of Bach's Kalaf Bible. Very good copy. Musicians and historians who have looked at this Bible refer mainly to his comments about the arrangement of music in 1 Chronicles 25 and 2 Chronicles 5 in the Old Testament where David arranged music for the temple, which Bach was doing for his churches. 
So these two chapters refer to King David and his son, King Solomon. In the margin beside 1 Chronicles 25, for example, Bach had written, this chapter is the true foundation of all sacred music. But then, beside 2 Chronicles 5, Bach had noted, in devout music, God is at all times present with his grace. This is Bach's personal Bible. He wasn't writing that for anyone else to see. It was what he believed. So you could see that he really believed in the scriptures as God's revelation to us. Two other sections of the Bible, however, intrigue me more. When Jesus teaches the priority of peacemaking in Matthew 5 and 9, blessed are the peacemakers, and then Jesus follows it up with the danger of letting your anger affect your relationship with others, a few verses later in Matthew 5, Bach had written NB, note well beside each of these. He had also marked off Luther's commentary on these verses. Now this was noteworthy. I had read a biography of Bach before that, and in his earlier years, Bach had trouble dealing with his own anger. He let it rupture some relationships, according to his biographer, Christoph Wolff. So I couldn't help thinking that here, in Matthew 5, as Bach was reading that and making notes, he was submitting his conscience to God's word and realizing he hadn't always been a good peacemaker. The other intriguing section was near the end of the Bible. After the well-known verse near the end of the Bible in 1 John 1, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. The Kalof Bible, Bach's personal copy, had included a long commentary by Luther on the value of the blood of Jesus. Of all these sections in the Bible that Bach had mar marked out, this was the longest commentary section. Now, I don't include it here. Uh, it's a long one, but you can see my written essay in the appendix. You can read that. So if you read that, and you think about it seriously as Bach did, as indicated by his marks, you would have no doubt about his deep evangelical faith in Christ and his work on the cross. And I read that, and I thought about that, and I thought, that's really profound. Bach already believed that. He believed that Christ died for him on the cross. So he wasn't a modernist in that sense. Of course, long before the discovery of the Kalaf Bible, Anyone who had listened to Bach's St. Matthew Passion or St. John Passion, often uh, played at Easter time, portraying the psalm events of the last week in Jerusalem through music and chorus, would have realized that Bach must have been deeply touched by Christ's great love and sacrifice for all of us. The wonder is that so many musicians and music critics today can be enthralled by these great passion oratorios and yet be untouched by Christ's love. In conclusion, there is no doubt that Bach was one of the greatest musicians ever. Part of this greatness was his ability to understand how the ear hears music. Philip Kennicott in the Washington Post concluded, Bach, the scientific composer, could be heard as a scientist who observed how we hear rather than dictated how we should listen. At the same time, Christianity Today pointed out, Bach the musician was indeed a Christian who lived with the Bible. In fact, Bach was truly a person of God's two books, his book of nature and his book of scripture. Bach respected and worked with what he had discovered about how the human ear hears music, along with equally respecting and working with what God revealed about music in the scripture. No other musician has combined such a high level of scientific skill and passion for music making, and at the same time, such a deep respect for scripture as Johann Sebastian Bach. Thank you.